Good evening. Please take your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 15. We'll get there at some point, debating whether to read the whole passage. First Corinthians 15 and the theme of the passage, as mo most of you know, <clears throat> is uh, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, the first uh, four verses, we have the gospel <clears throat> in a nutshell, and that is the death, burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then <clears throat> the rest of it, uh, Paul takes um, a defense and he defends the gospel and the fact that there was a resurrection and uh, he there was a proof of that and he and he preached that and then what's exciting is also that he took <clears throat> uh, the way he argued and his uh, his approach was he took their side of the argument and really drove the point home saying okay let's say this is the case that there is no such thing as a resurrection then this is the situation that we're in if there was no resurrection. So <clears throat> the title of the message is The Resurrected Life and how powerful the resurrection is and it should be in our life. You know, we as believers have nothing but life to hope for. You know, there's always light at the end of the tunnel. There's, it never just ends at death as a, as a believer. Uh, you t uh, in your in our lost state and in sal and then salvation, you know we have hope. But also as a believer walking this life in sanctification, we have hope. And then in the very end, we have hope that we're and uh, an ass assured expectation that we're going to heaven. And it's all due to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and how powerful that doctrine is. You think about all the other religious systems out there and who or whatever they are following, you know, they're only gonna go as far as who or what they are following. And none of them that they are following ever made it past the grave, except Jesus Christ, whom we follow, he made it past the grave. Uh, he, he made it past sin, death, and hell. And because of that, we have a, a lively hope. You know, 1 Peter 1, 3 talks about a lively hope, a living hope. It's not a wishful hope. It's not a dead hope. You know, speaking of reaching the Mennonite folks in Bolivia and how, you know, most of the Mennonites, uh, in a, a lot of them in their lost state, you share the gospel with them and you try to draw the net and usually they say, uh, well, I hope I'll go to heaven. And their hope is a wishful thinking. You know, a lot like we use uh, the word hope in our day, we use it in that same sense. It's, it's just wishful thinking. We're wishing that'll come to fruition, that which we're hoping for. And yet we have a lively hope, and the Bible says it's a lively hope, First Peter 1, 3, how? According to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we have a living hope, and it goes past salvation, and it goes into our hearts, into sanctification, and, and serving the Lord, and how we have uh, light uh, and life throughout our life, and then also glorification. And so the power of the resurrection we're gonna look at in salvation, the power of the resurrection in sanctification, and also glorification. And one thing that you can uh, disciple somebody very early on in the Christian life, and I would encourage you to do that, is to teach them the aspect of of sin and how God deals with sin in a person's life and how they'll have victory over that and how there's the aspect of when we're saved and how God deals with our sin and when we're saved, then we have dealt with the penalty of sin in our life. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Uh, we then have uh, then we are then free from the penalty of sin and teaching them early on that when you're saved, now you are saved from the penalty of sin because many fall into the trap thinking, well, now I don't have to deal with sin anymore, but that's not the case that, you know, we, we are sinners saved by grace. We're saved, but we're still sinners and we still have that old man that is with us. And so that needs to be taught. And then in, 
in the matter of sanctification, we are then free from the power of sin. And that has to do with our own uh, mind, our own will, uh, to the degree that we are free, but the power is there in the resurrection of Jesus Christ that we can be free from the power of sin and teaching them that your battle now is not a matter of you know whether you're going to heaven or hell, the penalty that was done on the cross, that judgment is taken care of, but now it's that daily judgment that God's looking at and seeing how you're doing with your uh, your walk with God and your sanctification and growing from, in gr- from grace to grace and uh, with hope and growing in the Lord, how that we're then dealing with the very power of sin and Romans chapter six, of course, seven and eight, dealing very heavily with that. And then finally, teaching them that one day we will be free from the very presence of sin, praise the Lord. Uh, that is a matter of glorification when we are glorified and when we are in our heavenly, uh, in our new bodies, when we are in the heavenly realm. And so the power of the resurrection is, uh, the, the doctrine of the resurrection is very powerful and it reaches every aspect of our life. The doctrine of the resurrection is cardinal to the degree that it is man's only way in, only way to continue therein, and only way out. In it, for by it I am quickened, continue therein, for by it I am conformed, and way out, for by it I shall be changed. I shall meet him in the clouds, I shall live, and that forever because of the resurrected one, Jesus Christ, who is the very resurrection. And whenever we're preaching a doctrine or teaching anything, we can never lose sight of the person Uh, the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and how Jesus himself said, I am the resurrection. And he proved that when he raised, I think it was uh, Lazarus. And so he proved that he was the very resurrection. And so when we're looking at the resurrection, we're looking at the Lord Jesus Christ and who he is and the power that he had. And it's just amazing once you get studying into uh, you know, the death of the Lord Jesus Christ and, and how he was buried and resurrected and what all took place then. So the resurrection, this is my hope. Hope to be saved, it's hope to be sanctified, and it's hope to be glorified. And so we well, we're well off defending the doctrine of the resurrection, just like the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15. Oh, that's a long chapter, 58 verses. There's just so much there, and it just grows and grows, and it, uh, yeah, so I don't know how to pick it apart, and so we might not go at it that way. (laughs) Of salvation, Peter said, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope, how? By the resurrection of the dead. And so he has begotten us again, the same as redemption, and that is that he, he bought us back. Well, why did God have to buy us back? It's because God had ownership of us at one time, and that is in the Garden of Eden. And so it's so powerful when you look at the doctrine of being placed in Adam or in Jesus Christ, and how secure we are in the Lord Jesus Christ, and how that, you know, some would say, well, when I get to heaven, I'm gonna, you know, give Adam a piece of my mind and, uh, and let him know what I think about what he did. But really, the Bible teaches us that we are in Adam, and it's to the degree that if it was your personality, your person, and you were Adam, you would have done the very same thing. To that degree, you are, as a lost person, in Adam. But on the flip side, according to Romans chapter five, the second Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ, to the same degree are we in the Lord Jesus Christ. There's nothing you could do or can do about the fact of who you are in Adam and even with the old man. And same thing as a born again, as a believer, there's nothing you can do about your position in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how secure you are uh, as a believer. You know, 
I'm, uh, I take security of the believer to the extreme, you know, it has just absolutely nothing to do with us, just nothing to do with us, that you, it's impossible for you to lose your salvation. In fact, if you're saved, it's impossible for you to stay in the grave, it's impossible for you to go to hell, you have to go to heaven. <laughs> Doesn't that sound exciting? You have to. That is the power of the resurrection. That is the power of the Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching in Romans chapter six, and I'm getting ahead of myself here, but of salvation, Peter said, blessed be the Lord, blessed be the God and Father of our, of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of the dead. That's 1 Peter 1, 3. Of sanctification, Paul said, and have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. And herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. He's talking about his, the, the fact that there's a resurrection and therefore it becomes very practical. And that's what we see at the end of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 where the doctrine of the resurrection is supposed to become very practical in the Christian uh, life and we'll get at that as well. Then of glorification, John said, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. And how powerful that is. We're talking about how that at, at salvation were pure, and now because of the doctrine of the, of the resurrection and the, the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ is coming, and that being our hope, we then don't just stay in, in that state of purity as far as salvation, but then further we purify ourselves. And every man that hath this hope in him, the resurrection, purifieth himself. That's talking about sanctification and, and, and serving God even as he is pure, that is salvation. But overall here, John is speaking of glorification. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that, we shall that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And so here you have three individuals preaching the resurrection, and then three different aspects of the resurrection in salvation, in sanctification, and then, praise the Lord, glorification. And the last reference was 1 John 3, 2, 3. <clears throat> Number one, the power of resurrection in salvation. <clears throat> like I mentioned, here we are free from the penalty of sin. And I, I think we should go back to that. I have a message that I preach in titled Motivated by Mercy and how that we need to go back to the day that we got saved and let that be a point of motivation in our life to serve God and to renew that in our hearts, the fact that we are free from sin. Uh, I, I got saved at a later age. I was 19 years old when I got saved and, and with a lot, a lot of baggage. And, you know, just to, to, I remember the day I got saved and just the burden was gone, the heaviness was gone, and just the, the power of the resurrection. You know, you don't, sometimes you don't really know how to explain the day that you got saved. You don't want to sound spooky, you don't want to sound weird or anything, but it, it's powerful, and how that the Lord Jesus Christ, when he comes in and saves and, and makes you a new creature, behold, all things are new, things change. <laughs> things have to change if it's all new. Imagine if you uh, got all new appliances, all new furniture, everything new in the house, you know, things would change. You know, it'd be different. I don't know, maybe you have everything new. <laughs> and so, salvation. Ephesians chapter two, I don't have this here, but we'll go there. Just thought of <coughs> Ephesians. Uh, verse one here, and you hath he what? Quickened. 
who were dead in trespasses and sins. And so how, are, how else are we gonna be saved from this? And how else are we gonna be, like the word here says, made alive? Uh, Hebrews 4.12, I believe it says, it speaks of the word of God, how that it is quick and powerful. The word of God is alive and it, and it gives life. And here we are quickened, and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. And so how did he quicken us? How did he make us alive? By the power of the resurrection. Just as Jesus Christ resurrected, we uh, did as well in that sense. Without the resurrection of Jesus Christ, there would be no salvation for us. For the wages of sin is death. This is our punishment, our penalty and our payment for sin. It is an eternal payment because death is determined upon sin for as long as there is sin, which in ourselves is eternal. Very powerful when you think of the need of salvation. And if you're not saved here this evening, the need is so great because there's absolutely no hope for you apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. Like I mentioned, because he is the only one that defeated sin, death, and hell, and he's the only one that went past the grave. He's sitting up in the heavenlies, and so that is why we preach Jesus Christ and him alone, because it is him alone. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and but by proof of the resurrection and him being the only one ever to resurrect, we know that he is the only way. Romans 6.23, if you think of that, for the wages of sin is death, I've often thought, well then, can I just pay the sin debt? And sure enough, you can pay your own sin debt. Will you go to heaven? No, because that sin debt is an eternal sin debt. And so that is how, why the, how, the, the, the fact that Jesus Christ died and rose again is so powerful because and it also teaches that he had no sin. That's why Jesus, he had to resurrect because it's the wages of sin that is death. And Jesus was sinless, therefore he did not stay in the grave. And so that, the same goes to you. In Jesus Christ, you have no sin and therefore you will resurrect. Jesus, who was made to be sin for us, who knew no sin, made this eternal payment for us, yet did not stay dead, for he was sinless. Because of his sinlessness, he had to resurrect. Death could not keep him. Uh, take your Bibles to Acts chapter two. Acts chapter two, verse, uh, verse 24 is the key there. This is right in the middle of Peter's preaching. I'm gonna pick up at verse 14. But Peter, standing up with the 11, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last day, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, Therefore that great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so that whole section there was actually a prophecy from Joel chapter two, from verse 16 to 21. Then Peter continues preaching, ye men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know, 
Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because, notice this, it was not possible that he should be holden of it. And so, no matter where you go in the book of Acts, and you can uh, go through the book of Acts, whenever Peter and Paul or anybody open their mouth to preach, they always preach the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. They always preach the gospel. Sometimes you have to look for it, but you can see here how he, uh, in verse 23 and 24, how they preach the gospel. And here he's talking about how he could not be holden in that death, and it was not possible. And so God raised him from the dead. Take your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 15, where we were. Verse 50, we'll read to verse 58. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immorality, immortality, sorry, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And so, moving on to sanctification, this is where we are free from the power of sin, Without the resurrection, we could not have victory over sin in our day-to-day life as a believer. The resurrection is to become very practical in our life. Yes, through it we have salvation and a position in Christ, but it has to become daily practical and a reality. Notice there what uh, Paul said in verse 58, and he's wrapping it all up. He's speaking of the resurrection. And because of the resurrection, verse 58, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. He's saying you have, there's, you're not just looking to the grave and that's the end. He's saying you have hope in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and because of the hope and because of the resurrection, thereby with that motivation, you can be steadfast, you can be unmovable, you can always be abounding in the work of the Lord knowing that your labor is not in vain. What did he preach before? He said, if there is no resurrection, my preaching is in vain, your believing is in vain, everything is empty without the resurrection, but praise the Lord, we shall see him like he is, and thereby we serve him, and we're steadfast, unmovable, because it's a reality. Uh, We have a, a, a living hope, we have something to look forward to, and it's real. Colossians 3, verse 1 to 17. This is one portion of the practical. We'll get into Romans chapter 6. Notice this. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. And so he's starting off this chapter now saying, if this is the case, if you're uh, in Jesus Christ, and if you are then risen in Christ, 
Then seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, shall ye also appear with him in glory. Or then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Notice this. This is talking about practical living and serving God. But notice, it's the power of the resurrection by which we're going to do this. And it's, it's counting yourself being risen with Christ and, and then having your affection and your sights on, the, uh, uh, on his coming. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Very practical now. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them. This is your life, that, uh, who you used to be. But now ye also put off all these things, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds. And have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, a barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your heart, uh, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, in the, of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. And so how powerful, now looking at this passage in the light of the resurrection and saying, this is, this is the power that I've given you to live the resurrected life. And we would call it the victorious life or, or other means that we might call it, but this is the resurrected life. This is the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the life that he has given us. This is who we are placed into, Jesus Christ. And so we have the power uh, to, uh, to um, not have sin reign over us. Let's take our Bibles to Romans chapter 6. start. My mic's out. Romans 6, we'll start in verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not those that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Now notice, this isn't speaking of baptism as water baptism, and the word baptized, baptizo, was just an everyday term. You know, nowadays we hear the term and that's all we think of, is the actual aspect of being immersed into water, but really it's just talking about the same word, immersed, and how we are immersed into Jesus Christ. And think about that now, just erase the whole aspect of baptism, and, look, and think of the word immerse. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, 
we shall also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, and the body of sin, sorry, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. He's saying this is who you are in Jesus Christ. You are immersed into him. You are placed into him. And by that, you are placed into his very death, his, his burial and resurrection. And he was raised from the dead. And now, uh, and now you have that same victory to not, and, and to not live in sin. That henceforth, we should not serve sin. Verse 7, for he that is dead is freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Now, this is the key. This is where it gets practical, and this is where we're supposed to count it the, the same as what we just read, our position in Jesus Christ and now it's supposed to become very practical. Verse 11, Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. And so many are, haven't got to this point even in their Christian life and they, they battle with sin and it's because they haven't reckoned it so. You have to sit down and analyze and say, okay, this is the case. I have to count myself in Jesus Christ, in his death, burial, and resurrection, and because he resurrected and because he's victorious, I can be victorious in my practical sanctification, day-to-day -day living, my walk with God. I can be free from the very power of sin, but how? I need to count it so. You know, sometimes we just need to go to the scripture, a matter of eternal security, you know, just count it so. This is what God said, I'm going to count it so. Uh, in the matter of any other lies that the devil would throw at you that, you know, God doesn't love you. Well, the Bible says he does, and so we need to count it so. And so likewise, reckon ye yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin. Notice there's that, that practical aspect where we, it's not just in and out of ourselves, but we do have to make a, 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 our mind a, a up about it. And we, we aren't robots and we have to do, practically do this and we have to yield one to another as we're going to see here. Let not, or let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that ye should obey it in the lusts thereof. Often we're looking at the, the matter of sin when it goes deeper than that. With every sin, there's something else going on. And James shows that pattern where we're first drawn away with lust. And lust has, is not always uh, talking about perverseness and things like that. It's just talking about a longing for. You know, you can have a, a, you can have a wrong lust or a right lust. And here it's talking about that First of all, there's that lust, and then if we obey that lust, it is then sin. And so, so often we're focused on the sin when we should be looking at what is that trigger, what is the, that lust that is drawing us away. And so practically living victorious, saying, I am in Jesus Christ, and I can be victorious in Jesus Christ because he resurrected and I, and I can now live the resurrected life. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, verse 12, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Verse 13, neither yield your members, so the key is which way are you going to yield? Your members, and it's very practical, talking about our physical members, yield your members as instruments of, uh, neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. And so how powerful the resurrection is and how practical it should become in our life and how we can have freedom and victory over sin when we apply the resurrection and the truth that that we have the victory you know we fight from a point of victory and that's what it we're, is trying to 
That's what uh, Paul is trying to get across in Colossians, here also in Romans, that th- look, look at first at who you are in Christ, just like the book of uh, Ephesians is uh, laid out, first three chapters speaking of who we are in the Lord Jesus Christ, and then the latter three uh, chapters speaking of how to uh, live practically the home life, uh, the workplace, uh, and, and so on and how to uh, live practically. But first of all, we need to know who we are in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he does the same thing in chapter 6 here, saying, hey, this is who you are in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you are victorious, but you need to likewise now reckon that and count yourselves to be dead indeed from sin, and then not let sin reign in your mortal body. Like a king on the throne you know, just hovering over and saying, do this, do that. You're letting sin do that in your heart, letting it uh, uh, sit on the throne and d- dictate what, what you're doing. That is what Paul is saying. Don't let that uh, uh, take place in your life. So, of sanctification. Next, of glorification. Without the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, There would be no hope past the grave. I think now we're just going to take some time to read some of 1 Corinthians 15. And then we'll end up with this. Verse 4. And that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And then so here's the proof. And that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also, as of one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles that am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach, and so ye believed. Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, How say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. See, the argument here wasn't whether Jesus Christ was resurrected. Yes, he's proving that here, but he's saying some are preaching that those that claim to be saved are going to be resurrected. He's saying, and he's saying some of them are saying that's not true. And then he's saying, well, if that's not true, then the fact that Jesus resurrected is also not true. That's what it's saying, verse 13. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, of the the lost saved people, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching in vain, and your faith is also also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised up not, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ is not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Look at the state we would be in without the resurrection, without uh, this doctrine. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Verse 18, then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. Notice this, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men miserable. That's what he's saying. If, if our hope only reaches the grave, we are of all men most miserable. But it goes further than that. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. That's what I was speaking of, our position in Adam, 
how you could do nothing about it. On the flip side now, your position in the Lord Jesus Christ, you can do nothing about it. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming, then cometh the end. And he shall have delivered up the kingdom of God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead, if the dead rise not all? Why are they then baptized for the dead? And why stand, ye in, and why stand we in jeopardy every hour? I protest by your rejoicing which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. I, if after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, uh, then so he goes on to uh, speaking of that, and then he talks about the seed and uh, and so on of of how the resurrection takes place, and so there he's taking a defense, saying this is who we are without the resurrection, but we know that he has resurrected, and so then we will uh, put on a new body, as he says, and so on, and, and the we will be immortal and we will be incorruptible. But in the end, thanks be to God, which giveth us, verse 70, uh, 57 again, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice how that's first. He has given us the victory already in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so there's our position, that victory. He's given it to us. And then verse 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And so let's press on and just, uh, I guess, a different aspect of, you know, the fact that we're saved and we're here now being sanctified and one day we're going to be glorified, looking at it from the power source that it comes from, and that is the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for uh, your word. We thank you for uh, powerful chapters that lend a powerful theme. And uh, Lord, just uh, the fact that you've uh, died for us, that you were buried, but Lord, you also, you rose again. And Lord, how that we have uh, something to look forward to, but also we have victory in this very present and also, we can look back at the victory and salvation. And Lord, whichever way we turn, we see your power. And Lord, we just thank you for that.